Welcome back to the All Turtles Podcast, a show about the future of work, the future of health, and entrepreneurs building the future with technology like AI. I'm John C. Fuentes, co-founder of All Turtles. Today, I'm interviewing Tammy Sun. Tammy's the CEO and co-founder of Carrot, a fertility benefits company, which is solving the growing problem of access to fertility care for employees. So today we're joined in the studio by Tammy Sun, who's the co-founder and CEO of Carrot. Hi, thanks uh, for having me. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Uh, so for our listeners, can you tell us what Carrot is? What's a Carrot? Carrot is a complete global fertility benefits solution for employers. Okay. I think we need more. What, what, are, what are fertility benefits? Like, like what kinds of things are covered by Carrot? Things that we cover for employers are egg freezing, IVF, in vitro, in vitro fertilization, adoption, and donor-assisted reproduction. So that includes things like access to donor eggs, donor sperm, um, gestational carrier services, commonly called surrogacy, as well as adoption. So my understanding would be that these are non-standard sorts of benefits for uh, most employers to offer to employees. I think it's standard in terms of how people are thinking about pursuing parenthood. I think it's non-standard in classic in insurance programs right. um, and traditional health plan coverage. And so there are, um, there are needs that employers have that we're able to provide service. Does Karen have like a founding mission or, you know, what's the... What, what did you notice was just missing uh, that wasn't being offered to employees? And you know, what, what, why, why did you make this? Yeah, so our mission is fertility care for all. What we believe is that every single human being on the planet should have affordable access to fertility treatments like egg freezing, IVF adoption, gestational carrier services. And, uh, you know, we think that employers have a really unique and important role to play, particularly in the, U in the U.S., around uh, access to care when it comes to fertility care. So, um, you know, in the U.S., more than 150 million people get their health coverage through employers. Right. That's more than Medicare and Medicaid combined. So we work with employers to develop customized plans for coverage around fertility treatments that is right for their business, that gives employees a great experience, but doesn't break the bank. The service is inherently just deeply personal. I don't know if there's a story to share or that'd be appropriate to share just maybe on your background and like how, like why this thing, like why, what brought you to, to want to do this? Um, I think, you know, it, it certainly started from a personal experience and it, uh, you know, I, I ended up navigating the, the fertility healthcare system on my own when I was an employee and I met my co-founder, who's a fertility doctor, mm. and we started sort of exploring this problem and asking ourselves que ourselves questions around affordability, around access to you know support. How do you find a clinic? How much does it cost? Um, et cetera. And we actually started from a place of wanting to build consumer products. Um, you know, that's my experience as a consumer of these treatments and services, her experience as a doctor from the fertility side. Mm -hmm. um, and I really thought that we would we would build something to help other women like me better access egg freezing only. Right. Um, but what we discovered is that the problem is actually much larger and um, the surface area for providing solutions to people is, is, is 100x what we thought. And most people who access IVF or go through adoption or are just thinking about how to um, manage their fertility health go through a lot of the same experiences that I went through in my egg freezing, um, in my egg freezing experience. So we started looking at consumer type products and how we can provide support and solutions to people who are looking for fertility treatments. Um, and ultimately, our hypothesis where we landed and what we still believe today is that access to fertility care is uh, first and foremost about a, an affordability problem, um, sort of solving the affordability problem, both for the employer as well as the employee. Mm -hmm. It's a hugely, hugely complex area of healthcare, fertility. Um, uh, but there is sort of a 
sequence of events in terms of how what kind of problems to solve first um, and what kind of problems that you get to solve later. Can you unpack that a little bit? Like, how would one even go about approaching this problem? Where, where did you start? Um, so I think uh, around around affordability, our, uh, around affordability, our hypothesis is that it is first and foremost the most important thing to help people afford access to care financially. Mm-hmm. Um, if you can't afford um, the care that you want or need, it's very hard to educate a person about that need. Um, it's really hard to uh, provide a better sort of care experience because most people may not be able to get to that point of actually experiencing care because they can't afford it. You know, in this country, there's just been historically a very limited income, a very limited geography, a very limited sort of subset of people who have been able to access fertility treatments. Um, you know, the, the current statistic is that I believe one in eight uh, opposite sex couples will actually have an infertility diagnosis. That one in eight only measures the people who will present themselves at a fertility clinic with a problem or um, a need that they want to address that doesn't account for the people who never even never even present at a fertility clinic because they they don't think that they can even afford treatment once they get there. And without having looked at any data to support this, I would assume just anecdotally that people are starting families later in life just as a trend and that this is, you know, the one in eight is largely underrepresented Mm-hmm. group of reality um, and that this is a bigger problem or a growing problem. Yeah, it's it's a growing need. Um, and and the problem is around access to care. Right. Um, so, you know, there's for the first time ever more females above the age of 30 years old are giving birth than females below the age of 30. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you, in the Family Equality Council uh, released research earlier this year to show a majority of LGBT individuals and couples plan to pursue parenthood in some way, whether it's donor assisted, whether it's adoption, et cetera. So there is a there is a fast growing need for these types of treatments and services, um, and the problem is really around access to care. Right, right. So how is care different from other fertility companies or employee benefit companies? You know, we're the first benefits provider that offers truly transparent pricing. So we've really aligned incentives within this sector um, to be on the side of employers and on the side of employees. So what that means is that, you know, similar to other areas of healthcare where pricing is super opaque, where you don't really know how much a treatment costs until you're billed for it. Mm -hmm. You might get a bill six months later. You might get a bill a year later. It might be $400. It might be $4,000. Carrot offers transparent pricing for the employer as well as the employee from day one. So you know exactly how much your treatment will cost. You have an easy way to pay for it. um, And you will never get a surprise medical bill in your life when it comes to fertility treatment. How much do these treatments typically cost out of pocket? You know, somewhere. You know, I prices are costs are coming down okay. um, across the board because there's more demand, there's right. more um, increasingly more supply, and you know, fertility clinics are competing um, on on price, and so that's a good thing. Right. Um, high quality fertility clinics making their treatments more affordable is a good thing. We see egg freezing can cost anywhere from five to seven thousand dollars in major major cities. Uh, IVF is somewhere between you know twelve, ten, and fifteen. Mm-hmm. So it's still really expensive. Right. Um, you know, prices have come down, but it's still really expensive. Can you talk about any companies using carrot? Are there any stories to share? Yeah, I mean, you know, we work at, at by the end of this year over a hundred companies, wow. um, more than a hundred and fifty thousand lives, and this ranges from sort of smaller companies, five hundred people, to large enterprises. Hmm. Um, and where we're most excited is really around the impact that the product has on not just employers but employees as right. well. Um, you know, I heard a story the other day about one of our members in Australia and the care team really 
uh, helped this woman access her frozen embryo at a fertility clinic in Australia because she had since moved to L.A. Mm -hmm. in order to continue her job, continue her work. So she was relocated from Sydney to L.A. And as part of that, the care team on the carrot side was able to help the woman transport her frozen embryo from Sydney to a receiving clinic in L.A. that would take the embryo where she was able to undergo IVF. Otherwise, she would have had to fly back to Sydney um, and stay there for many months in order to undergo treatment. So, you know, just the ability to have a team that can support you emotionally, support you through logistics, support you through, um, you know, the financial piece um, and access all sorts of partners and um, and services like, you know, cryotransportation of embryos across borders is something that we're super proud of to to say that we, we do that better than anyone else in the world. You just said it, world. And I think that's how you introduced your company is that you're a global service. Um, so you offer the service all over the world. Uh, how? Like, what, what are the challenges in doing that? And from displaying the information to actually integrating with providers, like how... How and why did you select certain geographies or where are you? The way that we have built our global product. So first of all, we've been building our global product since day one. Mm -hmm. Um, That means we've been building it for four years. Um, We're operational now in, well, by January, it'll be more than 40 countries around the world, including uh, obviously the United States. It is a hugely complex set of tasks that we have been able to simplify and make turnkey for employers. The gamut of issues to think about when you're delivering a global product like this include legal, include regulatory, include providers on the ground, um, distinguishing high quality providers from low quality providers, and also really thinking about cultural issues and small nuances around access to care in certain countries. Um, So we are able to understand in certain countries what um, might be illegal versus what might not might be just culturally inaccessible. Um, And those are two sort of different things, but equally important when you're talking about how somebody in a specific country experiences um, fertility treatments and access to care. So Carrot recently conducted a survey that showed uh, that half of millennials responded by saying that fertility coverage should be an equal part of healthcare benefits, like with medical, dental, vision. I mean, apart from giving you confidence that you're building the right product for the right people, what uh, were there other insights that you could learn from that? Or, you know, what does that statistic mean for you guys? I think it means that a couple of things. One, even if employees aren't talking about it, publicly or, you know, around the water cooler at work, it's a signal that this is a growing need among um, a large swath of the millennial generation. It is our vision and our and our belief and our work is really around making fertility benefits um, as standard as dental and, and vision at work. So how do you maintain this credo of fertility care for everyone? I think that's how you worded it. You know, regardless of sex, gender, orientation, or fertility diagnosis, like how, how do you live this value? Well, so this is the fundamental value that we build our products on and that we build our company around. So it is a foundational value for us. So we are able to use that as a guiding principle in thinking about inclusive design um, in terms of how we build products and, and UI and thinking about, well, who should have access to um, this type of service from an employee eligibility perspective, you know, classic sort of solutions from insurance say that only two people of the opposite sex who have tried and failed to get pregnant after six to 12 months can unlock infertility coverage. Um, And so it's really disease treatment Mm -hmm. um, versus sort of health, like disease prevention or health management. And so we have always believed and the product has always been, been built to support every person, regardless of age or sex, sexual orientation, gender identity expression, marital status, um, which can be important in some cases and in some countries is still really important, as well as geography. 
you know, that's our fundamental value when it comes to, you know, how we operate around the world. You know, we are respectful and, of course, um, comply with all local laws and regulations. So if there is something that is illegal in a specific country, um, you know, we, we comply with that. But our foundational value, the, the vision that we set for the team and for the company and our, our very public mission statement, which is fertility care for all, is, is how we think about the world and how we think about the future. So one of the things that kind of the themes that All Turtles has gravitated around over the last year or so is this concept of future of health and future of work. So how are employer-sponsored fertility benefits building towards that, building towards a future of work? Yeah, you know, so we believe that fertility benefits will be as common and as standard as medical dental and vision um, as part of standard compensation packages at work. When you look at the history of how dental and vision specifically came to be included as a table stakes part of comp and ben you really go back to the 60s and the 70s and you you think you can observe and track sort of a very ground up approach and a very ground up movement the unions were pretty involved mm-hmm. in making sure that these new types of benefits were included as you know what what employers covered as part of healthcare um, and you see similar trends in that today when it comes to fertility. Employers are sort of the the providers um, and paying for this coverage, but there's a lot of um, demand and you can see growing trends at the employee level where this is something that they expect, particularly millennials, when they come to work and they expect that fertility treatments and infertility is not a perk, it's not an extra. Um, People think about fertility as a fundamental part of human health care and that it should be a part of what is covered um, at work. And so the idea that you know, fertility will become as common as dental and vision um, sort of really depends on where I believe the true innovation is happening in the fertility space, which is at the employer level, Mm -hmm. because employers are such an instrumental part of health coverage in this country. As I said, more than 150 million people get their health coverage through employers in America. That you know, it's really important to give them a, a simple, turnkey, um, high-quality way to meet this demand without breaking the bank. Uh, cool. So that's what we do. Last question. Mm-hmm. Why is it called Carrot? Oh, um, actually, my my friend Andrew Sinkoff and I uh, came up with, with the name together at a like a, a naming party many, <laughs> many years ago. Uh, he used to be the VP of Marketing at Evernote, and we wanted something that, you know, is very important to me that the brand can grow, could grow into something that, again, back to our values and our sort of our our fundamental mission, that could grow to cover all people. So it wasn't a gendered brand. It wasn't illustrative or alluding to a specific sex or um, a female body part, Mm -hmm. um, and that it could grow to include men, to include women, to include single intending parents, to include couples, to include people really anywhere. So easy to say, easy to remember, um, and and really it was important to us that it would be uh, a name that could grow into something that was inclusive of everybody. So where can people get more information on this product? Carrotfertility.com. Cool. Tammy, thanks so much for joining us, and thank you for making this awesome product. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. Thank you. So now it's time for a listener question, and this one comes in from Leah via email. It's a long question, but it's a good question. Uh, I recently listened to another podcast, Tales of Silicon Valley, which talked about the tens of thousands of people who are employed as contract workers by Facebook and other companies to act as human filters for social media sites. These individuals are exposed to horrific images repeatedly, all day, every day, in order to keep the sites clean and safe for public consumption. I was greatly disturbed by the realization that in order to protect me from seeing these images, a subset of the population has the grueling task of looking at photos posted by the worst of humanity and clicking ignore, delete, or escalate. I immediately thought back to the conversation Phil and Brittany had during their sci-fi preneurship, uh, another amazing All Turtles podcast series. (laughs) Thanks for the shout out, Leah. Uh, They spoke about The Ones Who Walk Away from Omalis by Ursula Le Guin, where all the world is at peace except for the suffering of one child. 
And since learning about these human filters, I've struggled with the moral dilemma. There are people suffering so that I can enjoy looking at family and friends' pictures and posts. I see these human filters as necessary for the greater good because AI is not advanced enough to protect the public. However, this is definitely a role where AI can be a force for good. My question is, do you think we'll ever get there? Will technology become so skilled it can accurately block gruesome, inappropriate, or hateful images in speech? And if so, how long will it take? Uh, the narrator, Danny Forston, didn't seem to think it was possible. Wow. I mean, what a question. yeah, this is a great question. I think it boils down to like... Um, we, I think a lot of us assume that AI is already capable of doing this kind of um, right. very nuanced filtering, but really, no, it's not. It's I, I think we take for granted like the humans exercise judgment, and judgment, as it turns well, out, is difficult to in, train in what, into in AI. What you just described there, like the, the training element, there's hundreds of thousands of people working these, pardon my language, shitty jobs, not just looking at explicit content, but helping floor robots learn what floors are and like helping self-driving cars and like doing anything that you see in spatial reality with uh, a technology element to it there's probably an ai component and there's probably someone um, maybe like in mainland china clicking away and you know helping tag um, these sets or there's like i don't know there's companies like crowdflower or mechanical turk or all these just extremely poorly paying jobs that, uh, you know, these people are independent contractors doing kind of mindless work for pennies on the hour um, for us to enjoy all these services. <laughs> so, yeah, Leah, I, I agree with you in that moral dilemma. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I think one of the more complicated things about it is that she frames it as kind of being for the greater good. But I, I kind of am starting to question whether cause the example she gives is Facebook. I'm kind of <laughs> starting to question whether Facebook really is for the greater good. Right. <laughs> right? I mean, maybe the um, the human filters are not like the seedy underbelly of Facebook. Like, I think with a company like Facebook, it's all sort of seedy <laughs> underbelly in the end. <laughs> and maybe we need to yeah. think more about the kinds of services that we're creating that facilitate sort of this type of behavior on the part of, as Leah says, the worst of humanity. I just think the problem extends into like way more banal use cases for the things that we use technology for. And that's the really sad part. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, there's no economic boom in middle America and poorly educated people are spending their days making like 30 cents an hour clicking around random stuff so we can have yeah, and Talia's, said, Talia's question, like, own. we will probably get there, but probably not in our lifetimes. Yeah, right? I don't have any sense of prognostication on that. No idea. Like, I, I think that mechanizing away human judgment, I think we're a long way away from yeah, that. Yeah, I agree with that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I really... Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a long day. <laughs> spiral it all the way down. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Leah. It was a really well thought out question. Um, it was. It, and thank you for letting us opine on <laughs> the gradual deterioration of humanity. <laughs> for any other listener questions, you can email us at hello at all-turtles.com or tweet us at, at allturtlesco. This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. We recorded this episode in the world-class Donatella Studios in San Francisco, California. Thanks to Tammy Sun for joining us this episode. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, send us an email to hello at all-turtles.com. Marie reads every message. Thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, including Jim Metzendorf for editing, Marie McCoy Thompson for producing, Chris Plug for his audio expertise, Micah Rivera for our artwork, and Matt Armerman for our theme music. On behalf of Jessica Collier, Phil Libin, yours truly, John C. Fuentes, and the rest of the All Turtles team, thanks for listening. <laughs>